Hi, Chris. Can you hear me? There Join you are. with computer audio. Oh, that's yeah. the wrong mic. <laughs> Let's see, that's the good one. Hello, oh, sir. Yes, yes, that is the good one. Oh, how and are you? I'm good. I won't be using the video for the podcast, but can you share your? Yeah, yeah there, there, there you go. are. Hey. Good, good. You're there. And, How's it going? Uh, yeah, it's going very well. And now, uh, where are you up in Kingston now, or? Uh, we moved back to Ottawa. Oh, good. Uh, the lovely nation capital. Yes, yes, the big city. Have you uh, been? I've been good. Uh, we've been down in Florida so far this winter, but now I'm up visiting uh, some family here in Cambridge. So. Oh, uh, nice. Yeah, fifty degrees colder here than it was in Sanibel, Florida. <laughs> Tomorrow here it's going down to to minus thirty nine Celsius. Oh my lord! What is that in Fahrenheit? Minus. I think it's still cold. F. Oh, it's about the same. Minus thirty eight point two. Good grief! Well, <laughs> bundle up. Yeah. Um, well, uh, and what have you have, have you got a half hour? What? How much time have you got blocked off here? Uh, I've got until the top of the next hour. Oh, okay. Well, we'll shoot yeah. for 30. If we go a little over, that'll be good. Sounds and good. Uh, since uh, since you and I are both meditators, I wondered if we could just start yeah. with two minutes of silence before we start. I, and yeah. then I'll include that in the show uh, in hopes that people will have a little taste of what we're talking about. And I've got, a, I got a timer here that'll give us a bell in two <clears throat> minutes. So let's go. All right. Okay, great. Thank you. Ah, well, I uh, I've listened to some uh, conversations you've had about the book, and I know that you are someone who is uh, frequently fascinated by the things that you learn. And I wondered, in the uh, researching and writing of this book, How to Calm Your Mind, if you pull out uh, the discovery that fascinated you the most, what would that be? Mm -hmm. It would have to be the science of savoring. Now, the, the fascinating thing about enjoying life is just because we enjoy, we experience something pleasurable uh, does not mean we'll derive any satisfaction from it whatsoever. Uh, so I have this amazing cinnamon green tea in front of me in this mug that you can see because we're on video and uh, you know just because 
I sip on this doesn't mean that I'll derive any satisfaction from whatsoever. I, I could be drinking the most delicious cup of tea that has ever been produced in the history of the world, <laughs> a Mich three-star Michelin uh, uh, green tea, and not derive any satisfaction from it whatsoever. Um, but savoring is the name for the process of converting a positive experience into a positive emotion. And we can do this by uh, marveling at an experience. That's a type of savoring. So think of a uh, you know, look how you look out across the ocean or up at the up at the stars or enjoy your breath during meditation as we were just doing. Um, we, we can also luxuriate in an experience and uh, ruminate about it positively. So think of a cat uh, stretching out into the sun and, and just soaking it up. Um, and we can practice gratitude as well. And we can even uh, savor the past and the future. Uh, so we savor the past when we reminisce about it, when we look back on previous memories and think about all that is good. And uh, even looking through old photos works for that, too. And anticipation is a way of savoring the future. And so when we count down the days to, an, uh, to a trip, to an event, uh, to something that we want to be more present at, uh, the research shows that anticipating something creates these effective memory traces in our mind, kind of like a path that we walk down, that we then walk down again, that leads to more savoring when we actually experience something. Uh, so that was the interesting thing is, you know, we, we have all these aspects of our life that pull us out of the moment. Uh, we have uh, this craving for more that we have a lot of the time. We have uh, a desire, deep desire, a chemical desire for novelty in our brain, where our brain rewards us for each time we tend to something that's distracting. Uh, but counterbalancing these through something like savoring, which actually activates the here and now network in our brain that leads us to more presence and, and, uh, and focus. And I think that's ultimately all productivity is about, all enjoying life is about, is finding the presence and the the state of mind to be fully immersed with what you're doing in the moment. And so savoring is uh, this uh, marvelous practice where we get to enjoy the good things in our day, because why not get better at that and enjoy the fruits of our accomplishment while at the same time cultivating this uh, peace of mind and the presence to be with something that is good in our life. And uh, so there, there are so many different subjects that, that, you know, fascinate me from, from the things that I had the opportunity to explore in, in writing this book, but savoring comes to mind as something that uh, changed the game for me as it, when it uh, comes to calm. When, when you're savoring, uh, yeah. you're, you're in the present, as you say, you can kind of savor past and, and future, uh, and I'll, I'll join you. I'll, I have my ember heated mug with some Nespresso in it. And oh, the difference, lovely. Lovely. The, the difference between just, uh, having a sip and savoring is, is it kind of extending the presence? So I, I forget you and I drink, I taste the heat. I taste the, what, yeah. what, what is, what's sort of the, the granularity of, the savoring in the moment. So if you wanted to practice it, what, what kinds of things would you do with a cup of tea? Yeah, for sure. Well, first of all, for practicing it, one of my, my favorite techniques is the savor list. And so just kind of capturing every, every part of everyday experiences that you wish to be fully present in. Uh, but it, you know, it's a distinct um, uh, actual thing that is studied savoring uh, from mindfulness, but it, it's kind of a cousin of mindfulness in a way where mindfulness, you uh, you uh, appreciate the moment with the non-judgmental awareness. Maybe appreciate is the wrong word, but you notice the, the moment with, with non-judgmental awareness. Whereas with savoring, you notice all that is good in the moment and all that is pleasurable and enjoyable. And so it's, a, it's kind of a subset of mindfulness in a way where whenever your attention wanders from whatever is good in that moment that you are appreciating and enjoying, you gently bring it back 
you know, when, when you start thinking about your day and all that you have to get done afterwards, when the guilt comes in from savoring, because we have a lot of uh, guilt when, when we try to relax, you simply recenter around the positive uh, things that you're experiencing in the moment. So that, that was the interesting thing is how it's distinct from mindfulness. It's distinct from uh, flow as well, which is a, a bit more distantly related to savoring. Uh, but it's basically po positive rumination on the good. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's good. Positive rumination on the good. Um, your book was released uh, December 26th. And yeah. since then, you've had lots of good conversations about the book. You've heard from readers and interviewers. What has been the most surprising part of the reception to the book so far that you've experienced? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, it, it, it's been really surprising the depth of, of, oh, I feel like I'm tooting my own horn here. So please <laughs> let me get no, no, my comments by saying that. <laughs> you're free to toot. <laughs> but, okay, I will toot away here. Um, the, the interesting thing with the reception is, you know, I, I've written books on productivity and, and, and I'm fortunate that those have found an audience around the world. And so calm is a very new subject for me, e even though there is that direct relationship with uh, productivity. So uh, I actually think we make our time back that we spend investing in calm for, for reasons that I break down um, in how much more focus we have and how anxiety compromises our cognitive capacity um, by a significant margin about, uh, you know, how we, we can overcome burnout by finding calm as well. Um, and so the opposite of burnout is engagement. So there's productivity benefits to, to be had there too. But, uh, the, the most rewarding for me so far is hearing the feedback from people who have read the book and integrated the strategies in it into their life. Um, and maybe this is the fact that it's a, a different subject from productivity. So, you know, productivity advice has a, a tremendous benefit for the work that we do. And it lets us accomplish more. It lets us uh, become less stressed by our work. It lets us compartmentalize the work in our life and optimize not only the, the benefits, but also the contributions of the work that we do. Uh, but calm, it, when you break it down, when you break down the uh, benefits that a calm mind can provide, they extend beyond that of just productivity. Um, they allow us to become more creative. They allow us to become more resilient because we become more uh, resilient to future stress. We have a greater capacity to absorb it. Um, calm lets us experience more meaning, especially when we're able to notice how our actions are aligned to what we value. Um, calm lets us derive more satisfaction from our life, depending on what strategies we invest in, like savoring up, mm -hmm. up the top, uh, what, what we chatted about. And so I, I think, you know, just the fact that calm can have such a, a profound influence on so many different areas of our life beyond just work. Um, and, and, you know, <laughs> I shouldn't be so surprised to, 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 to have found that, but it, it's, um, it, it's fascinating because these ideas have completely changed how I relate to my own work and my own life. And so I guess it's not a surprise that people are thinking about <laughs> their anxiety and stress and burnout a, a bit differently, but that's been an immensely, um, a, immensely rewarding part for me. Ho horn uh, tooting over. <laughs> no, feel free. That's, that's kind of the purpose of this year. Um, the, it's the not Canadian of me though. Oh, that's I right. I can't do it. I can't do it. <laughs> you should be texting me things and then I'll toot back or something. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, one of the areas I thought was pretty intriguing was the uh, the whole burnout topic. And you found an expert yeah. on burnout and she had six factors, which you can sort of measure uh, as to how close you are to burnout. And mm -hmm. uh, I suspect that, you know, having a book out, being on tour, different, the, the things that you've done, uh, if yeah. you could go through the six factors and rate yourself on them uh, this week as to how you're doing uh, in, oh. in each of those dimensions. 
Yeah, that, that's a great question because they're probably I'm probably experiencing more stress from them with all the book stuff happening. <laughs> uh, so I think the the first the the first thing to that's important to communicate is just what burnout is. So we tend to think of burnout as a exhaustion and we'll, we'll say we'll we'll in, interchange those words colloquially as well so we'll say at the end of the day i'm oh i'm so burnt out when we're just wiped from from the day that we had uh but burnout there's a, a ton of just fascinating research surrounding this phenomenon that shows that burnout is not exhaustion uh so we need three things to be true about our situation for us to qualify as being burnt out we need that exhaustion that state of just total depletion um but we also need cynicism is the second attribute of, of burnout like there's this negativity behind what we do uh, like we're kind of depersonalized from the work that we do uh, and inefficacy is the third dimension so where we feel deeply profoundly unproductive as if our actions do not make any modicum of a difference whatsoever. And so experiencing one of these things is a sign that we're kind of on our way to burnout. These are stepping stones to that. Uh, and I did, you know, allude a bit earlier how the opposite of burnout is engagement. And so instead of being exhausted, we're fired up. Instead of being uh, cynical, we're, we feel there's a positivity behind what we do. Uh, instead of feeling ineffective, we feel as though we're making a difference. Uh, and, and the fascinating thing about bur burnout and exhaustion is, uh, like you mentioned, there's these six factors of our situation that are variables. And depending on how much chronic stress we experience in each of the six areas, that determines where we are in the sliding scale between engagement and burnout. Uh, and so workload is is uh, the first one. So the more that our workload eclipses our capacity to get things done, the closer uh, we become to burnout. My workload has been quite high. So I've actually experienced a significant amount of chronic stress. I, 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 I kind of hesitate to use the word chronic, actually. Um, Maybe uh, acute. Acute stress. It, yeah, definitely because acute it's, stress. And mm -hmm. That's an important distinction to make in and of itself. So we have these two types of stress that we face. Um, and this is obvious advice, but it's worth reiterating. We have acute stress, which is once off, chronic stress, which is repeated. Mm -hmm. And acute stress is actually great for us over the longer arc of time. Uh, that's the book launches. That's the mm -hmm. big things you're shipping at work. Uh, acute stress are family reunions, their weddings. If you went through your life and uh, scrubbed all the moments of acute stress, you'd get rid of a large amount of meaning in your life at the same time. Uh, so I might, I might say the book launch is a form of acute stress, uh, you know, workload wise, but there are elements of it that are more chronic stress related. So speaking ramps up around mm -hmm. book launches, and that'll be stressful over the longer arc of time, as well as meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, lack of control is the next one. So the less we feel we're in control of our situation, uh, the more stress we experience. So uh, I'm fortunate, I can say no to things, I can say yes to things, I have uh, my schedule, my life, you know, I, I, I can kind of manage things and run things in that way. Reward is number three. And so reward uh, refers to uh, not only financial reward, so how well we're compensated, stock bonuses are included, financial, uh, you know, salaries are included in that, but also recognition. And so being recognized for our contributions that we make, uh, I, I'd say, you know, I, I, I experience significantly less stress in this area than I did before, because it's it's so rewarding to have a book out there and hear what yeah. people think and hear about people who are benefiting from it after many years uh, of struggling through living a lot of this advice. Um, I finally get to share it with the world. So that's number three. Community is number four. So how close we feel connected with other people. That's been, uh, of course, a, an incredible uh, thing lately in, in, in mm -hmm. getting to talk to people about the book. So less stress from there. Mm -hmm. uh, fairness is, is the fifth factor. So how fairly we feel we're treated. I'd say that's about neutral. I, I feel I'm usually pretty good in that dimension. Mm -hmm. And values is number six. And so when we f are, are misaligned, when our deep values are misaligned to the work that we do. So if we value caring for other people and our uh, work is ruthless, it's cutthroat, it's going to be misaligned, 
And we're not going to be able to get a lot of uh, meaning from that, as well as we'll experience more chronic stress. And so it's interesting looking at this picture where there are kind of, you know, there's there are some elements of my work where I'm experiencing more chronic stress, but most of it is positive acute stress, which we relate to differently. And acute stress does not contribute to burnout. Burnout is solely caused by chronic stress that accumulates to a, a tipping point where we have too much of it at a certain point, certain threshold is crossed, and then we reach a state of burnout. Um, uh, but fortunately, things are going well in this regard, uh, but they change over time. And I think that's why it's so critical to check in with these factors. I don't do it every month. I don't do it um, every week. I'd probably do it once a quarter as the, hmm. the tectonic plates, the projects that comprise my work shift around. Um, and uh, yeah, so pretty good at this moment. But yeah, what about you? Oh, well, uh, yeah, uh, I, I actually drew a, a graph of the chronic stressors in my life when I was reading through the book and, and it was, it was just helpful to put names on, you know, what they were. Yeah. And, uh, and it's interesting in, in what you just said, how they can shift, because I can imagine in the time that you're working mainly in a solitary way on your book, the, the reward and the community part is you don't really know what the reward is going to be. It, and maybe there's yeah. some anxiety and, and you're, you're alone, you're not in the community. So in yeah. this phase yeah. of it, those become kind of, uh, you know, benefits in dealing with stress so that they, they you can see how they, they kind of move around like, uh, you know, audio uh, waves on a, on a mixer or something yeah. that depending you on your like situation a, and it's a like symphony, a not just one thing. Yeah. 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 Huh. It's, it's fascinating. Yeah. And you know, so there are times in my work where I realize I'm more stressed and so I need more community. That'll be uh, a cell for that. Um, there are times when I, you know, when I don't feel as rewarded or, you know, maybe that sense of community. So I'll agree to speaking engagements that hmm. might not make sense if I'm hunkered down on a big project. And so it, it, it's interesting how if we notice that more chronic stress is arising, we can counterbalance that in the, in the, for the other factors that kind of absorb that stress, which mm -hmm. is fantastic. Yeah, and full credit, you, you know, you mentioned the researcher. Um, when when yeah. you ask the question, uh, Christina Maslach, Maslach is, um, who, in my opinion, the world's foremost expert on the subject of burnout. Uh, she is the co-inventor, along with Susan Jackson, of the Maslach Burnout Inventory, which is the most commonly used instrument for diagnosing burnout. Hmm. And, and so that's that's worth mentioning. If you find that your chronic stress is super high on a bunch of these dimensions. And you find that you're on your way to burnout. You're exhausted. You're cynical. You you feel ineffective, uh, or some combination thereof. Turn to the test. It's fifteen bucks, and hmm. uh, it's worth conducting if you find that you may be out of whack. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking of a a, a blog post or or something that it would be titled "How to Stay Calm on a Book Tour." That yeah. you would get you. <laughs> You would give a, a sort of targeted uh, a, approach to this to fellow authors who are, especially yeah. you know, a debut novel. You work for two years, like your your first book, The Productivity Project, and mm -hmm. and uh, it, it, if you were going to tell that guy or uh, another author uh, how to how to stay calm on the book tour, what what would you what would you offer? I I would offer that whenever you talk about the book make sure make sure it's meaningful to people who who are listening hmm. uh make sure it's valuable and you know really approach a book tour um and uh, any promotion from a service mentality um you, you know try to genuinely help people from the ideas in your book uh because if they're helped by your interview um, they'll pro they're going to be helped by the book. <laughs> and yeah, so they're, yeah. they're more likely to pick it up. Uh, and if they don't, you'll have helped people. <laughs> and what's better than that? Um, and, and so, you know, I, I, and this works really well for me because I, I really value contributing to, to others or at least making an effort to. And so really connecting with those, those values on the book tour, I think is critical. And that makes, everything else manageable because you're doing it in service of other people and instead of of yourself 
Um, and it kind of helps everybody out at the same time. It makes the process, you know, to go back to the reward attribute of burnout makes the process so much more rewarding. Um, cause like, I, I don't know how many folks will hear our conversation today. Uh, a small percent of those will buy the book. Everybody else will hopefully still be helped by the book. Yeah. And so, we, so we help everybody else. So that that's my kind of philosophy, but the service yeah. mentality I think is critical with, uh, with promoting something. Yeah. And that's kind of freeing and it kind of takes the, the, the focus off myself when I think of what I'm doing that way. It, it, there's a lot to that. Yeah. Um, I, I think that uh, last time we talked uh, or maybe it was a different interview. There was an interesting uh, scene that you talk about when you're getting together with your editors at Penguin and, you, and you've got an idea for a new book. And like in this case, I'm going to write a book about calm. And the mm -hmm. question is, should it be a blog post? Should it be a book? Should it be yeah. a, an audible? And yeah. I, I could picture that when you first started saying, I'm going to write a book about calm, they said, Oh, good. This is going to be a 500 page book because calm affects everything or everything mm -hmm. affects calm. But did you do you re recall when you were first envisioning the book with your editors, the shape of it in terms of the length and and what yeah. what you would try to corral this really big important idea into as a product? Oh, that was interesting. The the interesting thing about this book is I didn't really intend to write it. Huh. Um, you know, I, I went through this burnout, I went through this anxiety before the pandemic. Um, and, you know, this is, I think, a burnout is something that most definitely more of us are acquainted with post pandemic, because if you think of burnout as the uh, result of the totality of chronic stress that we're experiencing at a given time, uh, a great way to pile on chronic stress with work, with home is a global pandemic, it turns out. <laughs> that'll work. <laughs> yeah, that'll do the trick. And uh, especially when a lot of that that stress is uh, is threatening. Uh, when, when, when that occurs, that produces a lot of anxiety as well. Um, you know, so, you know, just as burnout is a spectrum, as shown by the research that goes from um, engage, burnout to burnt out to engaged. Uh, calm is actually a spectrum too. Uh, I found out looking at that deep into the research that goes from calm to highly anxious, and depending on how emotionally reactive we are and whether we relate to our thoughts in a, in a positive or a negative way. And I, I actually, you know, the impetus for this particular book was one that I did not expect to encounter. Uh, I was on uh, uh, just a, a speaking event. And when I got up on stage one day, I was chatting about one of the productivity books. I noticed that when I got up there, that these beads of sweat were starting to form on, on the back of my neck. I noticed mm. my heart rate spiking. I noticed uh, just sweating and stammering and stumbling on my words. And I was having an anxiety attack on on stage on that particular day. And I actually thought I was doing a good job of investing in self-care at the time, though. Uh, I'm really big into meditation. I, I love going to the spa with my wife, reading good books, sinking into good books. Um, and so I, I remember asking at the time, just for my own personal, almost self-preservation, what do I have to do uh, to experience calm and make it last? Uh, I, I wasn't sure the relationship between productivity and calm, between stress and calm, how productivity is sometimes a source of stress in and of itself, with, which is worth dissecting as well, as well as our, our pursuit of more. And so it was really just a, a process of preserving my own mind and becoming more comfortable in my own mind that led me to the ideas in this book. Um, mo and so it's it, it's kind of almost an accident that this book is is created, but obviously it isn't at the same time. You know, once you realize you have a a collection of ideas that can hopefully uh, prove helpful as helpful to other people as as they are to yourself, um, then then I started to mold it into something shaped like a book. I don't think there was a page count or mm -hmm. or a word count in the original pitch, uh, but it it was amazing how easily that flowed because hmm. it was uh, part of my own story, part of my own research. Uh, and, you know, for any anybody who writes nonfiction, I think that's an incredible place to look is what are the ideas that have helped you? And what did you learn 
uh, about them. What, what's the research behind them? If that's something mm-hmm. you're interested in and have discovered and uh, how can they help other people out? And so it was really just, you know, I, I don't want to say an accident because that that's overstating it because obviously it's a, a book doesn't appear mm-hmm. <laughs> um, out of, out of the ether like this, but mm-hmm. uh, definitely the story and stumbling into the science and the advice that worked was not something I intended to write about, but sometimes you encounter ideas where you think, Oh, I have to write about this. Yeah. Yeah. Another, uh, well, when I first came across your work, it was with that Audible original uh, mm-hmm. about uh, meditation and uh, productivity. And I, I I think you said something then comparing reading a book versus listening to a book. And you used an image, which was uh, if you're listening to a book, say a nonfiction book about calm, and if the presentation is is calm and restful, it's like water flowing over a stone and gradually changing the stone and that sometimes in some situations it might be uh, my mind might be more open to being changed by hearing a book than reading it with my my sort of uh, student's mind or or whatever it is and you, you've got a great audible version of it that you narrate so you've got the the benefit of of your voice uh if you had somebody who was racked with anxiety and they say, Hey, I hear you wrote a book about calm and I really want to change my life. Should I get the audio book or should I read it on oh. my Kindle or paper? How, how might you uh, oh. guide someone in one direction or the other? Oh, that is so challenging <laughs> to do. I know they're both your babies, so I'm not, ex- yeah. <laughs> but, but I think there would be maybe different people might be more suited to, to encounter it one way or the other. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think we we all, that's such a fascinating question. Um, I, I think we all kind of experience things things differently when, depending on how we consume them. But we also all have this incredible wealth of data at our disposal from our own personal experiences. Right. And so, you know, I, I would be inclined to look back at the books that I have consumed in the past where I've made the greatest number of changes after consuming the book. And I would be inclined to consume the book in that kind of format. Hmm. And so maybe it's, and so I think that that advice generally works well for pragmatic nonfiction books, which ultimately the purpose of consuming one is to extract the maximum amount of value out of out of that product as possible. And so I would look in the past to, to previous data points. You know, what books did I make the most changes after reading? What format were they in? Maybe there's a, a trend line there. For me personally, I, I find that having a hardcover book uh, or a Kindle book for that matter, uh, where, you know, I can highlight, I can uh, in, in the physical book, which is ultimately my personal favorite format, you know, scribble in the margins, mm-hmm. tear out pages. I'm I'm rough on a book. <laughs> uh, it, but when my wife and I met, uh, and I think she almost broke up with me because of this. Um, she, I, I, what I do for a bookmark, I don't have traditional bookmarks. I, I rip the first page out of books and just use that as a bookmark. Oh, that's the, great. The look on her face, uh, when I did that for the first time, actually the look on anybody's face when you do that, it's like, you're committing a, a felony, like a crime. And yeah. I'll probably get some hate mail from this very interview, um, <laughs> about the that, librarian about that. association. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. There'll be like a cease and desist or something coming my way. <laughs> Um, so I'm, I'm rough on a book, but that's, that's the process through which I find I extract the most amount of value out of the product. And so for me, it's hardcover because, um, that's how I, I, I like to consume books, but for other people, they, they might find that, uh, audio is the only format that they'll actually end up listening mm. to. Um, and that the hardcover books just tend to stack up because the ritual can't be integrated into their life. And in that, in that case, that's better. But I think, you know, so often with advice in general, uh, with uh, ha- advice on any subject, calm, happiness, uh, productivity, we have so much data at our own disposal uh, where we have all the things that have worked for us in the past. So people uh, people read books on happiness and never really think, wait, 
when in my life have I been the most happy? Yeah. Uh, books on productivity. Wait, when was I the most productive at work? What conditions were true? Um, was I on a deadline? Probably <laughs> you probably yeah. were, uh, mm-hmm. what, you know, was the work more fun? Was I working alongside other people? Was there that sense of community? What, how was my workload level? Did I feel things fair and connected with what I value? Calm is much the same way. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, uh, take what works for you, leave the rest. Um, and yeah, yeah. look at your own data points. I think that's one thing that's that's uh, helpful about uh, this book. I, and uh, uh, and and when your wife was talking about it on the podcast, I heard uh, she she uh, she admitted her bias, but she was so enthusiastic. It's it's your best book, and she's read it three times. And 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 I think I heard that before I'd finished reading it. Uh, she's obviously a very intelligent woman, a professor, and everything. And I could hear something that had touched her Hmm. that was, I think beyond the fact that her husband had written a book. And I, and I think the stories you tell, starting with that story, that's really well told and quite gripping about the the moment on the stage and then the anxiety, but then all the way through, you'll, you'll take some research, you'll distill it. The research shows this, and then you'll bring a story in. And I think that maybe invites the reader to, as you say, access what, a story from the the reader's situation. Mm. Well, that's kind of like when I did this, you know, and that you're sort of opening portals to people's uh, experience by risking sharing real stuff from your own life. Yeah. There's a monk uh, that I love to follow. His name is Ajahn Brahm. And he has a lot of great videos on YouTube and a lot of great books as well. Um, And he describes, (laughs) he's very funny too. Uh, he, he's actually hilarious. And, and so you'll watch his, he swears. <laughs> he, uh, <laughs> a monk who swears. I like him already. <laughs> oh yeah. He's fit. And he used to be, I think an astrophysicist before Ooh. becoming a monk. And so super smart, uh, really fascinating and instantly interesting whenever you hear him talking and he describes, um, making somebody laugh. When you make somebody laugh, he he describes it as though you can toss the 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 nuggets of wisdom into their open mouth as they're laughing. <laughs> oh wow! And and I think you know I, I, somebody's mouth is there isn't a gape usually when they're listening to a story, uh, but I, I think of ve- of stories as sort of vehicles mm. for delivering this helpful advice. Mm. Uh, and so in writing a book like this, my job as the author is to respect the reader's time, uh, mm-hmm. to make sure everything is worth uh, consuming in the book, to work as a filter for somebody for advice that's helpful. But it's also to make things interesting <laughs> uh, so that people, so it's not a textbook and it's mm-hmm. not, it's, it's relatable. It's, it's vulnerable. It's, it's, it's interesting. And uh, I think above all else, it's human. Um, mm. really. And it's about that, that connection between hopefully me and, and the reader. And so, yeah. So in, in the same way that the stories, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that the, fu- that the funny anecdotes open somebody's mouth, you could throw the nuggets of wisdom. <laughs> in. Uh, I think of these stories as the vehicle that, uh, keeps moving things forward, but also, uh, delivers mm. the, uh, science, the, the actual, help. I'm not a huge fan of the word self-help, but um, the pragmatic advice that we all need to to live in a way that's more true to who we are. Mm-hmm. There was uh, one of the little nuggets that had an impact on me is uh, when you're talking about calm and anxiety and how anxiety reduces working memory. And I'm 72, so my working memory is noticeably uh, not what it was when I was your age. And uh, But I, I, it made me wonder if as people age, my father's 95, mm-hmm. the, the importance of finding calm in your life versus anxiety. I mean, we're all worried about you know, cognitive decline and and dementia and all that, I I would think that would be a pretty basic uh, um, factor as we age uh, more so than when we're, when we're younger. Yeah. And you hit the nail right on the head and the research does bear that out that our working memory capacity shrinks as, uh, as we get older. 
and you know our working memory capacity i should say uh i think we chatted about this in our last conversation but just in case people haven't tuned in it, it's essentially the mental scratch pad that we use to process the world around us so if you multiply 84 by 64 in your head you're using this working memory capacity. Um, you're using it logically to multiply numbers. You're using it, the visual spatial re reasoning to multiply the two fours and carry four, eight, 12, carry the one over. <laughs> um, and it, it's fascinating though, uh, the effect that anxiety has on our cognitive performance in this way. Uh, so if you had to give a speech to 5,000 people, and you never have, then that speech is in five minutes. And I asked you to multiply 64 by 84, whatever the numbers were that I mentioned. <laughs> it would take you two to three times as, as long to do that mm -hmm. before the stressful event. Um, if, if we were on an airplane and we hit a pocket of heavy turbulence and I asked you to read something or you were re reading something, you'd probably have to go back a few paragraphs to reread those paragraphs. So you could actually process it. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, anxiety hijacks our attention in a way that, you know, it pulls us out of the moment to pay attention to a threatening situation, whether that situation is an email notification in our, our external environment or other thoughts happening in our head. Uh, so we have that effect, the threat finding effect, and we also have the shrunken cognitive capacity uh, effect of it, where our working memory capacity has been shown to shrink by 20, 25 percent. Hmm. Uh, and so it, it's fascinating because anxiety is cognitively expensive and it consumes hmm. these precious uh, mental resources. Hmm. And so we have, you know, over the course of the pandemic, I think something that many of us have experienced is how our work takes longer. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have to work evenings. We seem to have more to do, even though the structure of our work hasn't changed considerably. Um, well, does it take 20 to 25% longer? Mm -hmm. Do you have to work, you know, instead of nine to five, nine to seven, or have two extra hours of work to do? Uh, is that about your level? If you do knowledge work, that's mm -hmm. the level that anxiety shrinks our cognitive capacity by, mm -hmm. not to mention the threat finding, not to mention the increased negative dialogue we have with ourselves in our head, not to mention the fact that we see fewer opportunities around us. So uh, a, a pos being in a positive mental state actually uh, increases our productivity by about 31%. Mm. Um, and this study was conducted a while back. Uh, so do calibrate for the fact that it might not be uh, an exact number. And of course, we're all different. But once you account for that as well, it's it, it's it's really quite remarkable the effect that uh, th an anxious mind has uh, on our productivity, but also the the room that we have to grow our working memory capacity as we invest in calm. No. Uh, so not only does anxiety shrink our working memory, calm grows it, hmm. uh, which is absolutely fascinating to mm. me. Because uh, mm. there are so few ways to actually grow our working memory. Uh, we can't really train our mind with these mind training apps um, because those effects wear off the minute, minute we stop investing in a strategy. Uh, meditation and happiness seem to grow uh, our working memory slightly and as does calm. And maybe mm. it's the effect that those have on a calm mind. So we, we think of relaxation we think of calm as something that we don't have time for and we feel guilty when uh those you know we we try to invest in relaxation but after living through this journey and experiencing the the negative productivity effects of an anxious mind um and not to mention the fact that it's uh, a much less pleasurable place to spend time in than a calm happy <laughs> productive mind um, I think, you know, calm is investing in worth investing in for productivity alone. And this is not to mention the other benefits that we can experience because of it. So yeah, it's a fascinating, fascinating connection. I, I debated between uh, whether to include that chapter on productivity in the book. Hmm. Um, but I'm happy I did because it can uh, absolve that that advice can absolve ourselves of a lot of this guilt that we feel by investing in calm yeah exactly another one of the things that i tried because it resonated you you talk about uh 
checking metrics like checking book sales or and sort of compulsively i guess that's a kind of a dopamine thing you're you, if you're about yeah. to check you might get good news and all of that and the ones that i uh tried it on every i'm always trying to lose 10 pounds so i weigh myself every morning and then yeah. i'm always trying to sleep seven hours because i'm not a good sleeper so i check my apple health and all this and so i yeah. wake up and i get two numbers that you know sometimes they're good news and i say hey i slept seven hours i'm gonna be a nice person today or hey i'm on the way but but i realized when you were writing about these things that it it's it's probably a source of chronic stress that every day i'm giving myself something mm -hmm. that uh and so I switched to just doing it every Friday. And so now the only time I check those two numbers is on Friday. And uh, I feel a little calmer, you know, and and, yeah. and it, it's felt kind of silly. But I, I'm interested in, well, first of all, when was the last time you checked book sales today that I want to know that? And then why does that work to sort of spread out the 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 sort of intervals between checking stock prices all these different metrics that sometimes yeah. we think are the source of happiness well uh i checked them a few hours ago i'm not gonna lie <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh you know i like to say i follow 90 percent of my advice 90 percent of the time that makes and it more so, credible <laughs> yeah 90 percent of the advice 90 percent of the time and so this is the 10 percent okay. of the 10 percent uh that that i'm not but i'm kind of it's know, understandable a book is a big deal so i'd be checking yeah. it every five minutes it, it's ex well yeah <laughs> so I, I i i find i'm uh yeah I, I think i think the key is how the, to check as often as the metrics meaningfully change uh. and so right now it's a global launch it's uh doing you know, it's doing, I'm really, really happy with mm. how it's going so far. And so I, I check once a, once a day or so, I, yeah. I'd say, uh, maybe twice a day, mm. but uh, that, that, uh, hidden stress, I, I think is the critical thing that we all need to internalize where just because something stimulates our mind does not mean that it makes us happy yeah. or any less anxious. Uh, in fact, what stimulates our mind usually serves to make us more anxious over the longer arc of time because it leads us to seek out even more novelty. Uh, the news is a really good example of this. So we'll get back to metrics in a sec, but the news is a great example of a hidden source of chronic stress in our life that we kind of grow comfortable with uh, the stress of. So uh, one one study that I re really remember encountering that shook me up and kind of changed the way I, I consumed the news was there was a study conducted around the 2013 Boston Marathon bombings that looked at two groups of people. The first group of people were those who watched six or more hours of news coverage about the Boston Marathon bombings. And the second group of people were runners in the actual marathon itself on that day. And what the researchers found was that those who watched the news coverage uh, experienced a greater level of stress than mm. somebody who was in the marathon and personally affected by it. Mm. Uh, and so we think about burnout, right? If burnout is the ultimate manifestation of chronic stress, wow, we're certainly adding a lot of chronic stress to the pile. Uh, social media is another good example of a source of stress that we've become comfortable with simply because it's familiar, and especially about things we're familiar with, like our friends, like our favorite companies, that, that sort of thing. Um, I, I remember watching Frances Hogan's uh, congressional testimony, uh, where she's the uh, Facebook whistleblower. Oh, yeah. And she described the, uh, the Instagram algorithm as being about two things, uh, bodies and comparing lifestyles. Mm. And it's hard to imagine you know, it, it's kind of a hidden threat as well from social media yeah. where there's this constant comparison part of our mind that's activated when we engage with it. And metrics are the same way, you know, uh, and things kind of fluctuate relative to our expectations and that our expectation level is kind of what the dopamine line in a way where if something is better than we expect it, 
um, to go, then we get a nice hit because it's more novel and mm-hmm. interesting to us. And novelty is one of the factors that release dopamine, which is uh, a chemical neurochemical that leads us to feel as though pleasure is right around the corner. Uh, but of course, half the time things exceed this expectation line. The other half of the time they're under them or, you know, if, assuming we're average at mm-hmm. predicting how things will go. Uh, and then we're disappointed. We're let down. We experience a dopamine decline <laughs> because, of, <laughs> because of that event. Mm-hmm. And so things, you know, they're speaking of Ajahn Brahm, he, he had a great, uh, great talk where things never go wrong. Um, he says things never go wrong. They just go differently than we expect them to. Mm. Things just always go. And what leads us to feel surprised or disappointed is not the event itself, but how, how we expected it to go. Uh, and so if you, you know, if, if you expect to get a $5,000 a year pay raise and you get a $2,500 a year pay raise, things went okay. You know, things yeah, pr- right. presumably went okay. You got a pay raise, right? Uh, but it was lower than your expectations, which, you know, I think there, a, a lot has been written about how you know, low expectations are a key, but I think actually having no expectations yeah. and still trying to mold things to go well is kind of the key there. So uh, it's interesting. Metrics, social media, uh, the news, all of these can serve as a form of hidden chronic stress in our days when we're not careful. Uh, and so often they do, and they push us closer to burnout. They push us closer to anxiety than we think they do. And then, then we give them credit for it. Yeah. And I think that's such a useful idea. It was for me because, uh, the hidden sources of chronic stress turned out to be fairly easy to address. Like, well, don't weigh yourself every day. That doesn't take a lot of smarts (laughs) or don't read the newspaper as much or whatever. And, uh, uh, that's a benefit of the book. I think is it just, it raises this question and you say, well, I wonder where my hidden yeah. sources of chronic stress are you know yeah uh well let's uh uh you've got you, your first book was about productivity and then there was a book about focus and then there was a book about calm i've been in my mind trying to imagine what is the trajectory here and you said something that uh one of the thing that you're most working on as a result of this work uh is the human connection part of dealing with stress and uh so you you have a partner that you're still married even though you're podcasting with a woman i think there's some stress just based on that but uh uh, is the next book going to be uh how to calm your marriage or something that has to do with relationships (laughs) or where where do you see yourself going next it's funny my editor uh he uh he said it well the my first book is called the productivity project and he said, if you ever have kids, I will publish the Reproductivity Project. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's a natural. <laughs> so I, I don't know if that's the next that one. That one's down the road somewhere. <laughs> yeah. My, my my philosophy when when writing a book, and uh, you know, a lot of people are, are thinking about their next book when they're writing the current one, uh, because they have all these ideas that arise mm. in, in the process of writing something. Uh, for me, when an idea arises, when I'm writing something, I put that in the book, <laughs> you know, even if it kind of veers off a little bit, because yeah. hopefully it's helpful. Hopefully it's interesting. If it would be worth basing a different project around, why not include that in the current project? Hmm. Um, and, and so that's my whole philosophy with creation is, um, is uh, you have to always assume that new ideas will come Yeah, uh, right. because they always have, they always will. Mm-hmm. And so why not just pour everything into the current project that, that you're creating? And so that, uh, I think right now for me is a time of renewal before, mm. uh, I, I have, I have too many ideas for, for future books, yeah. uh, too many. uh, and I, you know, I need some kind of time to think about which ones are worth pursuing because they'll be helpful and interesting. Um, and yeah, I kind of poured everything into calm and, and, uh, and so now's the time of renewal before the next one. I, you know, there will be a bit of time, I think, after this one. Well, uh, everything you put into this book really paid off. I, I think it was a, uh, oh, just you. a wonderful, wonderful effort. 
I have been speaking with Chris Bailey, the author of How to Calm Your Mind, Finding Presence and Productivity in Anxious Times, released in December by Penguin. Thanks very much, Chris. Thank you, sir. Always good to be here. All right. Let me turn off my recording.